Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by River, the place that I personally go to securely invest in Bitcoin with confidence and with zero fees. In 2021, the quote unquote value of my house went up by 31%. My house did not get 31% better, like at all. And my house did not get 31% more valuable. The dollar itself that you're buying that with went down in value. See so these videos reposted of people just like recognizing like, why am I doing this? I go to the grocery store and I can't buy anything. And like, I'm stressed at work. And I think people are starting to wake up to like, something's wrong here. Why do I feel stressed all the time about my money? I want to start off with uh, a quote that you had on Twitter, because I think this kind of is something that I deeply uh, agree with, empathize with. I don't even know if it's the right word. You said, I'm playing chess while others are playing checkers. What if the game is checkers? If the game is checkers and you're playing chess, you'll lose. It's not about ego. It's about understanding the game. I play checkers and buy. I freaking love this quote. So uh, what are you getting at here, Jim? I feel like people tend to overcomplicate things. You know, from a, from a financialization point of view of, oh, we have to go and create all these new types of assets and products. And well, what about this? What about that? It's like, look, what are we, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, and that's, that's what Bitcoin does. Bitcoin simplifies money. And yeah, yeah it's, so this whole thing of, I think it's a lot of it's ego driven. This whole like, oh, I'm playing chess while you're playing checkers. It's like, dude, what, like. That's great, but you could be way off because you're trying to put your ego first. Like just buy Bitcoin and be done with it. Yeah. That's it. It's not, it's not very difficult. It's funny. Owning Bitcoin, like I'm very vocal on this and I like it, sort of do this for a living is talk to people about Bitcoin in a lot of senses. So then I go like three years at a time looking like a moron, but then for like a year, every few years, I look like I'm unjustifiably smart. And it's really not because I'm smart. It's just simple. I just, I don't know, I'm, I'm playing checkers. I just buy Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, there's, there's a, an enormous amount of intellectual rigor that has brought you to the point that you, you realize the game is checkers and not this complicated, like 4d chessboard. And, um, so like, I think you have to, I think you have to talk to the deep, deep rigor that you had to put into understanding what is the game? What is my environmental factors that I'm dealing with to deduce and compress what appears to be this super complex thing down to something that's way simpler. So like walk us through that. If you know something really well, you should be able to articulate it simply. Mm -hmm. So like my kids for my, my oldest is six. So my oldest for a six year old has a really good understanding of how money works, what inflation is, how Bitcoin works, why Bitcoin's superior to other currencies. He and uh, uh, my father-in-law, his, his grandpa, play a game where my, uh, my father-in-law, they have a big globe, and Atticus, my six-year-old, has to identify a country and tell him about it. And then if he gets it correct, uh, grandpa will give him a piece of money from that country. And mm -hmm. because of this, Atticus has now accumulated lots of different currencies. Some of them are still strong. Some have been massively devalued. I have my $50 trillion bill from Zimbabwe. He knows about these things. And that's- You don't have the hundred? You have a 50? Yeah, man. If uh, I, it's, hard, it's hard to find the hundreds now. Ironically, they've gone up in value because they're collector's items now. Uh, oh, interesting. I would love to find a hundred. I have one. I have one in, in uh, I think it's in this book over here. Keep talking. I'm going to go see if I can uh, find it in this book because I'm pretty sure it's a bookmark in this book. Go ahead. Nice. You lucky dog. Yeah, that's uh, explaining to him how money works and how different currencies and debasement and why Bitcoin. If, if I did not understand this well, I could not articulate in a way that is simple enough for him to understand. And I think that's what you see a lot. And like, so I work in financial planning. I, I own a financial planning company and I, I talk to financial planners a lot. And what I've come to realize over the years is there's a lot of financial planners who are really smart and great at managing money. The problem is they've never stopped to ask, what is money? And that seems like such a foolish, stupid question, not unnecessary question to ask. You know, it's like a fish asking, 
what is water? The problem is, though, if your fish has been swimming in polluted water for a prolonged period of time, you never stop to ask, like, what is actually water anyways? You won't think to ask, is the ecosystem I'm in actually designed to provide for me what I need to actually to thrive and flourish? Yeah. If, you're, if you're used to swimming in sludge, that's sort of water, you'll be okay with that. Instead of asking, like, what is this? What is water? Then you'll recognize, wow, this is so different than the actual thing I'm supposed to be in. And you'll mm-hmm. look for that exit so you can go to be in that place you need to be. If we don't ask, what is money? Arriving at Bitcoin doesn't make it's sense. You're, you're then possible. trying to, yeah you're, yeah, you're trying to answer a question that was never asked. Yeah. And that's why people look at Bitcoin as being foolish. So it's, it's so simple. It's just starting at those first principles, those base questions. What is money? What is this? Why are we doing this? Um, and you, it logically arrives at, in my opinion, the most logical conclusion. Yeah, I totally agree. By the way, it was not in the book. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that'll just sit over there. Um, uh, when, when you're talking about this, do you think this is the reason why we see so many speculators is because at the core, they don't understand the core problem that's even being solved for. For sure. Like I, I have a buddy. I've been trying to get him to buy Bitcoin for several years. And he finally started buying some. But I ran into him a couple uh, about a week ago. And it's like, hey, man, you started buying yet? He's like, yeah, I've realized this is it's a great thing to trade. It's like, OK, you've bought some, but you don't understand why you've bought it yet. Yeah. And yeah, it's this is it's he is pl- he's trying to play chess when the game is checkers. Just buy Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, but he's trying to trade it and speculate with it and treat it like a some sort of stock that you're going to be going back and forth in. Um, yeah, it's, it's an overcomplication that's completely unnecessary. Like I'm a huge fan, you know, on like the Wizard of Oz, they think that the, the wizard, this, this great man has it all together, but then they pull the, the curtain comes all back on accident and it's revealed like he's a simple guy. He's just an old man with that's putting on this facade. And that's where I've come to realize most of the people that tradfy thinks is this great wizard uh, with a big booming voice is really just a couple old dudes calling the shots. Mm. And even people like me, a lot of people think that, oh, like this is what he does for a living. He must be super smart. Like, look, I'm, I'm a normal guy, you know, um, I, and I'm, I'm willing and uh, vocal on what I know and what I don't know. And until you go there admitting, these are things that I don't understand. Like, I think we'd, we'd all recognize the first step to buying Bitcoin is admitting I was wrong about Bitcoin the first time I encountered it. Mm. So you have to place that, come to that place of like, I'm not the great, great and mighty wizard. I am just a guy that's been behind a uh, little curtain this whole time. Um, yeah, you, you have to admit that you're wrong. I think we're all, we've all been there. I, I want to come back to that point because I think it's a really important point. Before we go there, um, I just want to talk about like speculators and um I think another thing that's that's really missed when talking about these people that are trying to time the market and they're looking at patterns in the price action and and these types of activities, I think a lot of them just don't have a deep appreciation for the the killer whales that are out there in the market and that can be a setting up a chart pattern to to suck people in as if it's a upside head and da- uh, head and shoulders or a head and shoulders pattern or this pattern or that pattern. And it's, and because they are controlling so much market share and, and maybe there's no other competitor out there, they're, they're putting on trades as if this pattern's going to play out only to get totally rug pulled by some massive whale. Then you compound it with the idea that maybe there's a second whale in the water that's letting this person think they're setting, setting up some pattern only to step in and smack the other whale in the face. And meanwhile, there's somebody there with call it a hundred thousand bucks thinking that they're a player and they're just getting whipped, just absolutely obliterated in the market because they're drawing lines and, and doing these things that they think are swoop deep, but they're actually just demonstrating how little they know when the whole game that's being played is a game of weight. How, how many sats are you able to stick on the scale over five, 10 years that is demonstrating true knowledge and true depth of the problem that's being solved. And 
Um, oh my God. It's just, it, you just want to bang your head against the for, uh, your, your forehead against the wall when you see it. And, you know, sailor talks about this sometimes, and there's a guy who's literally whips on around billions in, 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 in trading volume it, per week sometimes. And he's telling you, he's not trying to trade this or trying to speculate this. He's just stepping into the market and just trying to gobble up as many uh, Satoshis as he can. So kind of curious to hear your thoughts on some of that. You just never, you don't know. I mean, I'm not smart enough and it's not like a lot of this is not even a, a question of smarts. Yeah. It's, you don't have the information out there. Like, again, like what, what shark or whale is in the water below you that you can't see? Um, yep. someone reached out a few weeks ago when Bitcoin went to like 72 or whatever for its first time, like, Hey, should we go ahead and sell some assuming it's going to drop? Um, it's like, no, let's hang in there. And then it did drop. And yeah. then it was like, Hey Jim, like, is it going to go down more? And maybe we should sell some to buy again later. It's like, no, like stop. Um, and there's, there's a lot of ways to help address this. And another buddy of mine reached out, um, and asked, like, it, it was when it was at, back down to 62 and he asked mm -hmm. if we should wait for it to get to the fifties. I was like, dude, if I had, you know, X amount of dollars right now, I'll just buy it right now. I have no clue what's going to happen. And sure enough, that was a few days ago and it popped right back up to where it's at now. Like, I, I have no clue what's going to happen here. The thing is like, you know, if you're buying right now between 62 and 70, it's like, I have friends who bought a bunch of Bitcoin at like 400 to 700. And at mm -hmm. that point, 400 to 700 was a, that's a 75% increase, you know, mm -hmm. and that's huge. But now we look back, it's like, dude, you just bought a lot of Bitcoin super early. Who really cares? And I have to remind you know people of that, of the difference between 62 and 72 seems like a lot, but you never know what's, what could happen to cause it to go from 72 to 92 or 72 to 42. I, I have no clue. Mm -hmm. But one day you'll look back and say, I'm glad I bought early. Like those people who bought between one and three cents and 50 to 100 and 4,000 to 6,000, it'll be similar with 50,000 to 70,000. So, yeah. yeah. Um, trying, trying to speculate and time this is, is absolutely foolish. And again, I think that's a lot of hubris that tries to come in and say that you're, you're going to be able to do that, uh, to time it. And, Probably not going to work out well. Maybe it will. Um, yeah, that's the, the like like you mentioned with Sailor. It's recognizing. Look, this is an accumulation game, not a trading game. Yeah, yeah. Um, to your point that you made earlier, you were really talking about ego, and you're talking about uh, you know a person who thinks that they have more information than they do, or they just think that they have to do. Going back to your checkers example, they think they have to do these miraculous, uh, you know gymnastics like fantastic things in order to outperform and um it's just way simpler than that i i guess and that's very difficult to overcome so like what do you tell like what advice can you give somebody to develop an appreciation for that or to believe you because i think you can even tell people this and they're and they're still saying yeah but i i think i can you know get better timing here or whatever so how do you, how do you broach that subject with somebody? Uh, I, I like to think I'm a pretty good orange pillar. Um, so like, again, in my company, like basically all of our clients have exposure to Bitcoin and 90 plus percent of them came to us as normal people looking for a normal financial planner. I, mm -hmm. They totally got the bait and switch when they got me. Um, <laughs> and it's in order to have them go from looking for you know, a dude in a suit who's going to help them just land in a 60, 40 portfolio to where we're at now requires education. Um, and that's, that's, we, we start off, I don't lead with Bitcoin. I've taken a lot of flack from people on Twitter saying that like, like my financial planning website does not mention Bitcoin on it. Like I came, I'm, I, I came to reach these people who need rescuing, not the people who already understand this thing. Um, so I'm not going to advertise that. Otherwise I'd scare them off. So, um, I, I wait until we've provided immense value in other areas, built a plan, talk through tax planning, show that I'm not a moron. That way, when I bring this up, there's actually at least some level and degree of trust. Mm -hmm. And once we go there, there's a, I believe you actually uh, reviewed this book eight years ago. It was Chris, uh, Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference. Mm, um, yeah. It's a book on negotiation. And um, I take some of those tactics. So like a tactic that I bring up with clients is, hey, um, 
you're going to think I'm absolutely nuts. But I and our clients own Bitcoin. So you start off with that is identifying, hey, what I'm about to say is going to sound crazy. If you don't, re if you don't acknowledge that, they're going to sit there and think like, this guy's crazy. But if you admit you're going to think that I'm crazy when I say this, you're disarming them already because at least you recognize you're a little bit nuts. Yeah. And then before you go into telling them like how Bitcoin works, you have to go into tell me what you know or you have heard about this thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because again, if you're sitting there and getting the best argument, but in the back of their head, they're thinking it's used for drugs, it boils the oceans, it's beanie babies, they will not hear anything you have to say. They're going to be waiting to bring that, that thing out to shut down all of what you've said. So you have mm -hmm. to disarm them by allowing them to get their baggage on the table. It also gives you a place to start off that you're not taking, talking way underneath or over them. Um, but just starting off, okay, what, where are you with this? And then we go back and we go through a history of what is money and what are stores of value. We march through that, like way back to, you know, the, the classic Bitcoin stuff, rye stones and, and Rome. And then we go through like different forms of money and how money has been debased over time. We arrive at uh, post-World War I Germany. We talk through uh, gold confiscation. We talk through Bretton Woods. And then that leads us to Bitcoin. And then I go into Bitcoin itself and how it's not this thing that was created, you know, 10 years ago by some tech bro in his basement so he can buy a Lambo. Like this is a thing that super smart people, way smarter than I am, have been trying to work on for several decades. Mm -hmm. And so we go to this history. So it's, it's again, leading to the proper question. So when we present the answer as, I think it's Bitcoin, we know what question was asked. Mm -hmm. That allows us to go, why Bitcoin versus everything else? And those everything else could be US dollars, stocks, bonds, uh, but also other cryptocurrencies. Um, so we arrive at this thing, there's, there's an education. So anyways, to quasi sort of non answer your question, how do we do this? It's, it has to be anchored in deep education. Education builds conviction and conviction builds strong hands. Um, if you are not properly educated, you will want to abuse this thing rather than actually adopting it um, and holding it. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you have, it's, it's, it's a matter of first principles. What is yeah. this thing? And unless you go there, you will be apply, you'll be trying to apply programs and trading formulas or whatever on top of this versus base at level understanding what it is, then you can actually move forward with how to own it. Yeah. It's kind of interesting when you think about how, how massive this is on a global scale, but yet, um, cause typically when people arrive at, uh, a solution, they deeply understand the problem like first, and this is like all that almost flipped on its head where you have all these people participating in this market and for you know, if you lined up a hundred of them that, that own or participate in this and you ask them very deeply describe the problem that's being solved here, I think a lot of them might give you such a generic answer that it's like really not hitting the, the bullseye. It's kind of like near the target, but they don't even really understand what the problem is that's being solved for. And, um, I don't, I just don't know. As, as an educator in this space and in a person that's been covering this for a really long time, I, I, am, I struggle with, is this a function of culturally what's playing out um, with the a byproduct of fiat itself? Is this because we're just doing such a bad job from an education standpoint? Um, I, I just don't know, but I, I will tell you it's something I struggle with to to stay sane and just uh it, it's it can be it can be tough it can be yeah. really tough to be patient um with, with people so um i guess a few things this is quite sort of anecdote anecdotal but i would totally agree the adopters um of just or, or buyers or speculators obviously goes up that's like this uh i think it's pierre who did the like uh the hype uh Mm, yeah, I know the hype phase. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the three cycles following a having the hype, mm -hmm. disillusionment, and the third one. Yeah. Um, and that that I think that really directly shows like there's a lot of people who get into it via hype. Mm -hmm. Most of them fall off and are disillusioned. But each cycle, there's a new class of people who actually are educated. 
Uh, and it's you can buy this thing as hype and speculation, but you will not be a long term holder, or it's going to be very difficult for you to be one, or maybe you're an accidental long term holder. There's a there's a meme I saw a few Scott that was hilarious. It's uh I've managed to not sell my Bitcoin from you know two dollars up to seventy thousand. It's like how'd you do that? It's like well I, I lost my wallet. Um, so maybe maybe you're an <laughs> accidental holder. Um, but besides that, like yeah, it's, you have to actually be educated on this, and there's new classes regularly coming in and being educated versus just buying it as a speculative asset. It can be difficult to be patient with people on helping them understand the problem where it's tough for me. Like I love educating people who are normal, where it's frustrating for me is being patient with people who work in finance. It's like, all right, this is your job is to learn these things and you're doing a massive disservice. Like there's a a group of financial planners I used to be part of a forum with and I had to leave because I just got, I got mad. I don't want to think I was an Mm. absolute jerk. So I just had to step out. Mm -hmm. It's like this, it's like 5,000 advisors in that group that represents hundreds of thousands of families that they're they're mm-hmm. working with and they're giving in my opinion bad advice yeah so uh when did you, you step i'm curious on that when did you step out from that because uh, one of the things i wanted to ask you was just how how it's evolved because you have one foot in this bitcoin culture deep into that into that culture and you know like all the talking points on twitter and all the you know the the psycho memes and all that kind of stuff. And then you have your other foot in traditional financial advisement uh, space. And I couldn't imagine what the contrast of those two different cultures are. And I'm, I'm curious how it's evolved, call it over the last four years. Like if you'd go back to 2020, pre 2020, like what was that culture like? And then like, what's it like today? Has it changed at all? Just help us understand what that, what that's like. Yeah, the, my, my life is quite dichotomous in that sense. So yeah, like Bitcoin Maxi, like my assets for a handful of companies that are in the Bitcoin peripheral space. And I own my companies. That's it. Um, and I'm very open with my clients on how what I invest in and the things that I own and how I view these things. Um, and then, yeah, the other, the other foot that I, that I have is in this traditional finance CFP, super quote unquote prudent way of investing. Like, They think that if you buy any, most financial planners now have been so sucked into buying the index that if you, anything beyond that, you're some try, like you're trying to like time the market or whatever. It's like, dude, Mm -hmm. it's first off, what frustrates me is these people not recognizing that they too are being active in some capacity. If you're, even if you're just buying the index, you're making a decision how you're weighting those indexes. What you're buying is small, mid, large cap, international. You're making a decision. It's just a little bit less active, but admit it. You are making a decision. So. Um, yeah, I listening to podcasts, I was listening to one last night and the, there's, they're outside looking in speculation is that financial planners are starting to adopt this more heavily or understand it more heavily. Um, I'm a very small, you know, piece in this, but my view is at least in this like deep CFP fee only financial planner world. No, it's not. Mm. Um, not nearly to the extent that people are hoping it is right now. So yeah, I've been, I've been into this for, for like really vocal on this for right about four years now. And, um, what that looks like is for, for the last several years, I would go quarterly onto this forum of financial planners. And I would just say like, Hey, I really would love y'all to learn about Bitcoin for yourself and your clients. And it would be like a hundred people commenting, calling me an idiot. Um, mm. And then I would come back a quarter later and say, hey, like, it'd be really great if you could learn about this. My calendar, here's my calendar, put a time on here. I'd be, lo- I'd love to talk with y'all. And again, people just call me a moron. This has been like this for years. Last, last February, um, I posted Pierre's chart, that hype, that, that, that chart. And I said, because I meet with all of our clients every February and August to basically pull apart their plan and rebuild it. Yeah. So I put in that forum, that chart, and I said, Right now, we're meeting all of our clients and we are really putting our foot on the gas to increase Bitcoin allocations. That's when Bitcoin is like 20,000. And again, people were, I was thrown on the bus again, like hundreds of comments calling me a moron. So I put out there just for fun. I said, all right, anyone who wants to take me up on this, I will go all day. Uh, VTI at that point, Vanguard Vanguard Solar US Index Fund was at $200 and change, like 200 and something cents. I said, hey, I'll pick up five shares of VTI. You pick up, 0.041, 0.041, whatever it was a thousand dollars of Bitcoin in sats. We'll both pick these up. December of 25, whoever's w- is worth more, the loser has to deliver that person's asset to them. No one took me up on it. So the final straw was uh, February of this year. So last month, I 
went back, I screenshotted that, oh and I posted gosh. again. Like, hey, I would love to talk with y'all. Um, also, here's an update on that wager I made. And if anyone wants to uh, update this, I will keep VTI's appreciation, and I will I will wipe Bitcoin's slate clean. Anyone. And it's still, it's like, you're such a jerk. How could you? It's like, you hurt my feelings. Um, and at that point it was like, okay, at least people just think I'm, they, they just think I'm rude. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything that would compromise my, my integrity. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm going to step out. Funny enough though, I stepped out and I did have several financial planners since then reach out to me directly and say, Hey, I actually always appreciated your candidness and your post. Um, you know, I guess they were afraid to speak up because then they would be lumped in with being a lunatic like me. I don't know. Um, but I, uh, a friend of mine sent me a screenshot of, again, I'm not part of that forum anymore, so I can't see the conversations. A buddy sent me a screenshot probably two or three weeks ago. And it was a guy saying, hey, we're looking how we can allocate maybe 5% of a portfolio to something tactical to get alpha. We're looking at DFA funds. And, um, and like any ideas? And all these people were posting things. And a guy commented and said, this is where Jim Kreider would hop in and say he sh you should buy Bitcoin. And then people are like, yeah, that guy, that guy. And then people started speaking. I was like, I actually sort of liked it. And this one guy chimed in and said, actually, after his posts before he left, I went and I bought a little bit of Bitcoin's or of uh, Fidelity's ETF. And it's gone up massively. He might be right. So um, I'm hoping I'm hoping the soil is getting better um, slowly. But yeah, that's it's very interesting. Going back, you mentioned something earlier, like it's how do you not rage quit though? I guess I'm, I'm looking to you for advice right now, Jim, because like, how do you not rage quit? Cause for me, I'm almost at a decade at this point with, with this back and forth and this incessant, like what feels like me just taking my forehead and banging against the wall. And it's exhausting, man. This is just exhausting. Like how, like you, you are not in the form anymore, right? Like you're not like, yeah. It's because you were just so frustrated. Yeah, I did not want to say, I didn't want to come across as a jerk. And there's a point it was like, I was viewed as a jerk for a very long time. Yeah. But I was still bringing value. But I got to the point, at the, I got to a point where it was like, I'm casting pearls before swine. I'm going to step away. Um, I think I'm much more tolerant from normal people rather than financial planners. Because financial planners, like, again, these are like super smart planners who like, out of the system, like th these weird terms, like uh, like fee only CFPs at super RA. smart as long as the currency is not failing. Because yeah, yeah, they're like you know <laughs> cream of the crop financial planners. Yeah. You would hope you or your parents or grandparents go to like these type yeah. of people, crazy smart people. And uh, the problem is they pride themselves in thinking differently than like the other like traditional like Raymond James or Mer Merrill Lynch guys. Like, okay, we're gonna really do what's best for our clients, but they won't go there. And that's what frustrates me. But like, yeah, normal people, I can go with that all day. Because I remember I was one of them. I heard about Bitcoin in 2012. I didn't pay attention because I, the guy that I heard it from, I thought was, I thought he was probably stoned most of the time. But like, all right, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I used to be that guy. So I, 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 I shouldn't expect some guy off the street to understand that like, oh yeah, our money is absolutely broken and you know, all these things. You have, to, you have to pay attention to these things. So well, here, I, you mentioned earlier about the, identifying the problem this made me think so so i'm i'm a i'm a christian and you can't if you come to someone and say like hey jesus died so you can be saved they won't understand that the thing is the old testament was thousands of years in the making of sh there was a law that was given to people and the purpose of the law, of the law was to show that you can never fulfill the law it was to show that you were absolutely broken and in need of something outside of yourself to save you that was the whole, that was the role of the law. That way, when the solution came, being Jesus came, you could recognize, okay, what I have, I can't do on my own. I am absolutely broken. I need something outside of this to save me. So you have to be completely aware of your brokenness. So I look at it in a very similar way uh, of you have to be complete. You have to be aware of the broken system. And if you're not aware of that, you don't, you don't have the need for solution. Um, and again, most people just don't know the system's broken. And that's where, again, like educating our clients, showing them like that bill that got passed this weekend of like the $1.2 trillion that was just passed over like a couple hours, a thousand pages that no one read. It's those things. When you just bring those up to people, they'll like, 
oh, wow, something seems weird. That's when I went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole deep was March of 20, when all of a sudden the shutdowns were in, were in conversations. And it was like, okay, this is odd. Something's got to be broken. I spent a couple of weeks going on these crazy long walks, listening to your podcast, reading books on gold, gold mining, and Bitcoin. And after a couple of weeks of just like, that's all I did basically. I was like, all right, mm -hmm. I'm going to go with Bitcoin. Uh, but I, I would not have gone there unless I recognize something's wrong with the apps, like the foundation level of our structure. And most people just don't know that yet. I think one of the things that makes this really complicated is when you're looking at the dollar and, and somebody's saying, oh, it's debasing, it's debasing. And so what, what are they typically comparing it to? What, what most people are typically comparing the dollar to is the performance against the euro or the performance against the yen or some other like major top five, top 10 currency. And when you're looking at the performance of the dollar, let's say you're looking at DXY, the, the dollar index relative to like all these other major currencies. When you're looking at that, that comparison of these currency to other fiat currencies, what you're finding is that there's these gyrations, but for the most part, it's really not changing all that much over a 10, 20 year period of time. It's pretty generically, there's just, like a generic amount of volatility between them. And so a person's looking at this and they're saying, well, the dollar is not really debasing all that much. Like it's, I, I don't know what these crazy Bitcoiners are talking about, but what they're failing to, to measure it against is something that is a hard, desirable thing. And where this gets even more confusing is when they do that, they're not accounting for Jeff Booth's thesis, which is te technology is a deflationary force. And so they're looking at it like, oh, yeah, the prices aren't going up that much. And so you have like these two, in my opinion, the, the thing that really makes the, the problem difficult to wrap your head around are those two dynamics, whether they're comparing it to fiat or they're comparing it to some physical hard thing. There's things that are that are naturally masking the issue at hand. And, and so they're looking at Bitcoin and they're saying, oh, well, it doesn't produce anything that's uh, like there's no free cash flows or anything. And it's just all this speculative mania that's causing the price to go wild like this. Meanwhile, it is the gauge. It is the freaking gauge that's, that's showing people what the real problem is because it's the only one that the governments can't plug or mask or hide of the other two things that I described earlier. Yeah, that's no, so good. I love, uh, uh, Sailor has an interview with Tucker Carlson. And he brings up that uh, the inflationary basket of goods. And he mentions like, look, if you're, yeah, if you live in your parents' basement and you eat Domino's pizza, your inflation rate's going to be next to nothing. But if you desire like scarce, desirable goods, your inflation yeah. rate is something different. And that's where, like, so my, my house, I live in Texas and a lot of people move to Texas and especially our town. Um, but like in 2021, the value, quote unquote, value of my house went up by 31% during that yeah. year. Mm -hmm. My house did not get 31% better, like at all. I have, I have four young kids. There are holes <laughs> got worse. in <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Holes in our sheetrock from our kids running into the walls. Like it got 31% worse. So you have to recognize my, like, yeah, maybe we could, we could attribute some of that growth of, uh, of value to like real growth to people coming in. Um, the problem is most of that's nominal and my house did not get 31% more valuable. The dollar itself that you're buying that with went down in value. Yeah. And I think started, people are starting to wake up to this. That's why you're starting to see like, I don't have TikTok, but I see these videos reposted of people just like sitting in their cars, probably after a long shift, recognizing like, why am I doing this? I go to the grocery store and I can't buy anything. And like, I'm stressed at work. And I think people are starting to wake up to like, something's wrong here. Why do I feel stressed all the time about my money? And why does it seem like it's not taking me as far? I have people all the time. I had someone put on my calendar yesterday morning um, that, hey, uh, young family, make they make good amount, uh, like multiple six figures, could have done like a few decades would have been doing insanely well. They said, make this much, um, but feel like we're constantly behind. And that's where I think people are just at. It's like, what's, what's wrong? So they understand now there is something in the water. Going back to that terrible analogy about the fish. There's something in this water. It's getting, it's getting murky. But what is it? They don't see this massive you know, pipe just dumping in this toxic waste. Um, 
yeah, you it's so it's being trying to be patient with people and recognizing like I'm I I did not know this all the time. Um, I was fortunate enough to listen to you and listen to other people. Um, and yeah, you eventually you have to do the work yourself. Yeah. Here's a question I got for you that I would think would be frustrating if I was in your shoes. And it's uh, you're dealing with couples a lot of the time and the the management of their money, and you you convince one of them like they they get the problem, they understand the solution, but there's two of them, and it's like. How do you, how do you deal with that? Cause that's a problem I don't have to deal with. I just record shows. I blast them out into the ether and like people either like it or hate it or whatever. But like you're having these intimate relationships with people one-on-one -on -one, having deep discussions. And I can only imagine that like it can get really challenging at times, especially getting into, let's just say that they both agree to take a position. Then it's like, what's the proper position size? Because one of them might be like gung ho and wants large. A large position size and the other one's like i want less than a percent or whatever so talk us through how how in the world do you manage that because i would imagine most people listening to this show are dealing with this exact problem all the time yeah yeah um i guess a few things to that so i, I had a meeting last night it was 10 o'clock meeting with a family i've worked with for a few years now and we we just calculated like all right let's get updates where you are and we recognize that right now 41 percent of their total investable assets are allocated to bitcoin and we were talking about one of their investment accounts. Um, should we increase, decrease, or keep the same towards your Bitcoin allocation there? And they said, Jim, what do you think? I said, well, you know, let, let's hear what y'all think first. And I knew the husband <laughs> posed the question. I knew he wanted to increase. Um, and then I just, I just prodded them some with like, consider volatility, consider sequence of return risk, things like this. Like what would be part of my job? And they, they both like, okay, yeah, I definitely want to go up. What about 25%? What about 35%? And they just sort of bounce it back and forth. So it's, I, my wife, Kendra, brought this up a few nights ago of like, she doesn't really care about Bitcoin. Like she, she goes along with it. She understands what she needs to know. But like, I would assume she's a lot like your wife. Like she, your wife has a pot. She didn't have a podcast about this. Like, yeah, great. I, I trust you and I love you, babe. We're in this together. That's, that's at least where Kendra and I are. That is exactly um, where my wife and I are as well. Just so people know, like she's, she's like, very happy that I get a lot of joy out of all of this, but just like not her cup of tea and not very interested in any of it. It's kind of funny, actually. But go ahead. Sorry. No, it's like, yeah, Montana this fall when we go out there for that, that Bitcoin retreat. Like, Kendra's going to come so she can go hang out in the mountains, not so yeah, she can talk about yeah. Bitcoin. That's totally yeah. fine. And that's how most of our the, the couples we work with are. So to get to a place where we can have good communication and arrive at proper action steps, we have to go way back. So way back is not assigning portfolios or talking tax planning. It's also not talking about goals. Like we want to buy a lake house. We can't go there. We have to go back to the underlying values. What is important to you as a family? So like I have sort of two definitions of money based off of the context. So one of those is that money is a tool or a resource to help you do what's important to you in life. And my job is to help you use your money in the most efficient and effective manner for that purpose. That's what we do. So our, when we start off with working with families, we have to go there, like underlying base values for your family. What's important to you? That has to be, that has to be past goals. If it's like, oh yeah, we want to have a house in the mountains. Like, okay, that, that seems arbitrary. Why? Oh, we really want, we want a place that we can gather as a family to create memories. It's like, oh, you don't want a house. You want memories with your kids. That's what you want. So we have to go there. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want retirement. You want freedom to spend the time with who you want to be with doing things that are important to you, not retirement. You want mm -hmm. time freedom. So we have to go there. Once we've established that, then we go into what's the goals you have, recognizing like your goals are going to change, that like, your goals today are different than they were five years ago, and they're going to be way different five years from now. That's totally fine. The purpose of a goal is not to be arbitrarily tied to this thing you once said was important to you. It's to inform what's the best next step to take. Understanding as you take these steps, that goal will change, but if your goal is informed by the backdrop of those values, even as that goal shifts, you're still ultimately pursuing the underlying informative of that. Mm -hmm. So values, goals, then we talk through decisions. So we talk through the opportunity cost, the things that you will have to decide upon. If you choose one thing, you are directly or indirectly giving up something else. If we've gone through all of those things properly, finally taking action should be relatively easy. 
Um, I forgot who said it. I heard it years ago on the podcast. When your vision is clear, the decisions are easy. Mm. So we have to start with clarity of vision. So values, goals, decisions, finally action. So once we've got to this place of taking action, I know it sounds like a lot of like talking through allocations and Bitcoin and all these things, but really we've done all the hard work up front. Now we can go and we are less apt to waste resources, money, time, career choices, family choices, because we have direction of what's important to us. Everything's being addressed or uh, informed by that. So for now, yeah, it's like, hey, Bitcoin allocation. They, we already discussed the opportunity cost. Also have them do sort of a pre-mortem of like, when we start working together, what's the most likely things? I paint this picture that's relatively grim in the future. And it's like, what things, what actions were taken or not taken? What things happened or didn't happen between now and then that got you to this point? So I allow them to inform me and themselves what's probably the most likely cause of them being unsuccessful. So anyways, once we've done all these things, then we can go to specifically, like, like in this case, like Bitcoin. And it's less of a Bitcoin conversation. It's, we've already got, we've done the hard work. It's like, okay, cool. Now, mm -hmm. now we just talk through the opportunity costs, the risks, the volatility, um, these other things. It's like, okay, now we can move forward. And we're less, we're, we are super apt to not change our minds. So like when we had, we had a client who joined in like the all-time high, 69,000, you know, prior all-time high. And they rode Bitcoin all the way down to 16. I didn't have a single client who sold Bitcoin at the bottom, not a single one. I had a lot of clients who we went and scooped up a whole bunch at 16 to 20. It's because your values didn't change, your goals didn't change, the underlying role of our view of Bitcoin didn't change. Why would we change our plan? Um, yeah. Yeah, of course, if, if, you own, if you own Enron, you know, and it's down to two cents, still sell it. But you have to understand, like, why do I own this thing? And that's where we have to anchor into education. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's, that's sort of hard for me to answer. Like, how do we arrive at those conversations? But it's super easy if you start off on the same page. That's where, like, I mean, that's why I got into finance. Money's the number one cause of divorce. It basically, every year, this, these studies have been done. So we have to be articulate and communicative on what's the role of money for our family. And mm -hmm. if you've started there and you talk through my second definition of money is money is a means of communicating, storing, and transferring value across space and time. And then we've talked through Bitcoin, and we believe, I believe Bitcoin's the best form of money we've ever had. And it's like, cool, money's this thing, and it's this thing. Are you aligning your money with what's important to you? And is Bitcoin part of that? And if so, what role does it have? And then it's inevitable that we bring these clients who came to us looking for normal dude in a suit um, for a 60, 40 portfolio arrive at, yeah, we should definitely own some Bitcoin. And usually that starts off for me, conservative for most people, absolute nuts. Like, I guess people on Twitter would think it's still conservative, but normal people like at first our, our average allocation for clients were like 10 to 20%. Right now I'd say on average, our average, our clients have 35% of their total investable wow. assets, in, which is yeah. maniacal, but like yeah. in, in some senses, but like we are, deeply talking through these things. Like you show someone a chart of post-World War I Germany, that, that the gold versus uh, German marks. It's like, I'm not saying that's, that's the in case right now, but like, okay, at that point, like does a 2% allocation in gold make sense? Does a, yeah. So it's all about education and informing deep. You, you have to go there. You, you, there's no shortcuts to this. That's mm -hmm. the problem with like, that's why people get frustrated is because you don't get it. You don't get it. It's like, well, they never had the understanding of why they should get it. And that's, I don't know. I don't, I have the privilege. I recognize it of people wanting to have these conversations with me and trusting me um, versus like, you know, a drive by, uh, by Bitcoin that you're, you, yeah, you're, you're less apt to get an adoption from that because you don't have that trusted relationship and those, the ability to have those conversations. I think it's an important highlight. And I don't know that this is true. I suspect this is true. When you're saying such a large holding, I would imagine it's because you have people that have been dollar cost averaging for a long period of time, and it has taken over their portfolio to be this sizing. And the number one thing I've heard for a decade of doing this show from the, the best in the world at managing money is you don't sell your winners, especially if the thesis hasn't changed. You let it run. You let it ride. You don't pay the taxes. You, you, you allow your winners to run. And I would imagine that's why a lot of people that 
you said such a large because that is for for a financial management that is massive allocation but bitcoin has a tendency to just take over your portfolio if you've been allocating to it consistently for four years like it's just going to take over your portfolio that's how at least it has you know in my case um, yeah that's the the meeting i had last night it was okay right now i think we bought in it bitcoin was like five percent of their total investable assets maybe uh -huh. Yeah. And now it's 41%. And we wow. talked through like, okay, like I would assume at the end of this bull run, like totally guessing, obviously, but like, I would assume it's going to be like 90% of your total investable assets. Like it's yeah. just, it's a function of these things. And that's where, you know, the, I, again, I live in this weird dichotomous world of like who did CFP stuff and like, okay, at that point, do we take chips off the table? Why does it make sense? We talked through the impact of long-term cap gains. Like, all right, based off how, if we guess Bitcoin's X amount and your cost basis is X and you're going to be taxed at, 18.3% long-term cap gains. Like you better hope that you time that dip by at least 18.3% dip to buy that thing to break even on a post-tax basis. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's lots of fun conversations. I like the point that you're making uh, in in your answer to to the couple's question, because I think it's it's super profound. It's super important, which is ask yourself why five times is kind of the the saying. As it goes, uh, when you were describing, I want a, a house in, in the mountains and I want to go do, you know, I want it to be like this. And it's like, well, why do you want that? Well, it's because I think it'd be a lot of fun to go skiing or I, I think it'd be fun to, to live in a mountain town. And it's like, well, why would it be fun? Well, it's because my family would be there. And like you, you really pull the thread on like, what is the root of, the, of why? And then when, you, when you're looking at it very objectively, and at the core of, of the why, you can say, well, do I need to really be making payments on that particular house uh, every day of the year? Or can I just rent it out for one week or two weeks out of the year at a drastically reduced expense? And you, and can I go to five different ski towns if that was something you desire, uh, as opposed to going to the same one? And would I get more enjoyment? And you just, you're able to really kind of pick apart uh, what works best for you. And I, what I find so fascinating about this is when you're dealing with money, that you're not worried about it being $1 being worth 90 cents or 80 cents in a year from now, you're able to kind of take a step back and ask these much deeper questions because you don't have this propensity or this urge to spend it as fast as humanly possible because it's going to be worth less tomorrow. I, I just think that it's so important. And I think that so many of us are just great at lying to ourselves, Jim. I think we are. I think we are. I think we're so good at, at lying to ourselves as to what it is we actually want because so many of us have like deep seated insecurities or fears that are driving a lot of our decision making as opposed to a frame of reference that there's just absolute abundance all around us and we can harness it at any moment that we want if we just change our perspective or change our point of view to harness it i've i've had countless conversations that lead to tears for people who are like super successful um, mm -hmm. it's really, or, or people who like totally miss the mark and mm -hmm. what happens a lot. So for a while I did, I worked particularly with, with, uh, physicians who are about to, or just retired. Okay. So these mm -hmm. people are usually making half a million to 2 million a year mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, in their sixties, early seventies, and we would sit down and we would talk about their family and those sorts of things. And we'd look at their money. It was like, wow, y'all were like wildly successful, successful financially. I'm really curious. Like. What made you want to do this? What made you want to be a you know anesthesiologist and do these sorts of things? And the the, the answer is so often, it's so sobering. It's well, when I was a kid, my parents fought, fought about money all the time, yeah. and we didn't have good clothes, we didn't have great food, we never went on trips, and I just heard them bicker all the time. And I decided when I was twelve, I wanted my kids to have a better childhood than I had. It's like, man, that's that's amazing. And clearly you able you were able to provide them in, for them in a different way. How was it? How was being a parent? How were y'all's kids' childhood? Was it able to be what you hoped it would be when you were a kid? And man, I've had so many occasions where they just stop and realize for the first time, like, I don't know. 
Mm. I was at work too much. Mm. I missed it. And yeah, I break, you know, people break down in tears all the time recognizing that. Like grown men making a fortune, realizing the whole reason I did this is so I can spend time with my family and man, it's gone. That's why I'm very cognizant of my job. Like, again, like I want, I want financial freedom. One of those reasons is so I can spend a lot of time with my family. Thing is, again, I have four young kids. My kids right now want, to, want for me to read to them at night. They want me to sword fight with them in the afternoons. They want me to be present. I can't say, hey, Atticus, um, sorry, I can't be around. Don't worry, though. We'll get a house in Telluride in 10 years. Then we can hang out. You know, in 10 years, like, forget you, dad. Where were you when I wanted you to read to me and cuddle me? Amen. Like, again, like, if you are not being informed by what's important to you, you can have a goal, but that goal is going to be way off. You think you want a house? You want time with your family. You think you want retirement? You want time to do what's important to you. You think you want lots of money? No, you want options to be generous and to give and do. Like, yeah, but you you cannot go there until you've asked these questions. That's I think that's sort of why like Bitcoin's easy for me because like for these conversations because they're super similar. I have these questions of like life. What's important to you in life? Your money is just a means of helping you do what's important to you in your life. Oh, and then we move to Bitcoin. What is money? Like, what is Bitcoin? We're not talking about Bitcoin as the solution to a problem. We have to go deeper than that. Like, what's the problem here? What's the thing we're trying to address? And it's a, it turns over to each other, the conversation type, super simple, like simply. And uh, people start connecting the pieces of why and how these things work and actually how they work in tandem. One of the most common questions I get asked from family and friends is, Preston, where do you personally buy your Bitcoin from? And the answer is really simple. I buy it on river.com. Not only can you easily buy Bitcoin with zero fees on recurring orders, you can have peace of mind knowing Bitcoin on River is held one-to-one -one in multi-sig cold storage, all while being fully licensed and regulated in the United States. Plus, their relationship managers are US-based and available by phone for you or your business. Additionally, River has built their own infrastructure from the ground up, which means they don't rely on third parties to function like other Bitcoin exchanges. River also just created a new feature not found anywhere else called River Link. It allows you to send Bitcoin over a text message to easily orange pill your family, pay a friend for dinner, or send a gift. There's a new standard for investing in Bitcoin, and River is setting it. Go to river.com slash fundamentals and get up to $100 free when you sign up and buy Bitcoin. That's river.com slash fundamentals. Woo. Amazing comments. I just have to say, just uh, so refreshing to hear you say some of this stuff. Um, all right, let's uh, talk uh, more specifically just about Bitcoin. This is one of the questions I love asking people. Uh, what is the one thing that you think is super important about Bitcoin that is lost on so many people? Again, this is going to seem super simple, especially to most of your listeners who are super familiar with Bitcoin. But recognizing that Bitcoin, it's not a company. It's not a stock. Um, it is the denominator um, in these equations. You have to go there. And that, that then informs so much. Like there's not going to be stock splits of Bitcoin. There's not going to be arbitrarily more units created. Um, it's not competing against uh, the NASDAQ or a particular company. It is the thing that those things are going to be priced in. And you... That's something that is so profound that on a regular basis, I have to remind myself of that. When you're thinking through, again, like if it's like, oh, should I buy, should I buy this real estate property or heck, even owning my company? I was talking, uh, Jesse Myers, you've had Jesse on your show, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were I was talking with Jesse recently and he, he was like, look, man, I've come to terms that it's most likely that like the things that I own are probably the most valuable in Bitcoin terms that they'll ever be right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you, and that's, that's someone who's super ingrained in Bitcoin. And it's, it's that like, again, this, I love, I love the simple things, like just reminding yourself of that. Um, yeah, it is, it is the money. Um, yeah. It's so true because I just know my, my behavior as a consumer has so drastically changed the more that I, deeply understood Bitcoin. And the more that you, you go through yet another cycle, you just, you find that you, you become quite efficient and you find that, oh yeah, I just really don't need that. 
Like I could totally go buy it, but I just really don't need it because you're, you are valuing everything as this is the most valuable that this will ever be in Bitcoin terms. So like, I just don't really need that. And I don't know. It's, it's very strange because I know what I was like before Bitcoin. And now I obviously have been in it for a few years and it's just like, you can see the change happening in, in yourself individually. I can only imagine what that means from a corporate standpoint, from a, I mean, hell, look at MicroStrategy. Like, I mean, you talk about uh, a shift in, in how they think about everything and how they perform economic calculation. And now like, let's zoom out to the country level or the local government level. Like once, once leaders truly start understanding this, it's going to just be a fractal of what we're experiencing on an individual level and how we think about our own consumption and what it is we need and how efficiently we were, we're trying to live our lives. It's just freaking crazy. So I guess the question would be this, like, what do you see culturally shifting in the next five, 10, 15 years? It's going to be an understanding of Bitcoin. Like I personally, I'm probably, I'm probably wrong. Um, but for right now, I think that we will continue to see to some extent the, these ebbs and flows of the price movement dictated or highly correlated with the having cycles. But I think we'll see a massive decoupling from that in the 2032 cycle. Um, I, think, I, there's, I think there's two reasons that would lead to that conclusion. One of those is more broad, uh, deep education and adoption. Again, uh, educated adoption is what's going to build, build strong hands and long-term conviction. Versus this hype, this, I mean, that's the hype that leads, that fuels all this speculative mania. So broad understanding and education. And I think we need more time. Again, like right now, the adoption rate, educated adoption rate of Bitcoin is like 1% of the population, so, but it's picking up massively. If I was going to push back on that, okay, and I'm not trying to uh, be a proponent of it happening faster, but when I'm looking at like what is truly going to drive it to, to take off at an accelerative pace, it's not the number of participants. It's the, the people that control the existing buying power figuring it out. So yep. if you're a person who's, who's controlling five, a $5 billion bond tranche and you figure this out, or you're a person who's, who's in charge of a G7 country and you, you have enormous influence on the direction of where things are going. I mean, look at El Salvador, right? The, the president there, he's, he's figured it out. Um, but he's controlling a pittance in the global, uh, scheme of things with respect to the amount of buying power he's throwing. Around. But what happens when, when a few of these people that are controlling the purse strings of society and these flow, the, these flows of energy start figuring it out. Well, I'm sorry, but things are going to, things are going to spiral really, really fast, like really fast. It doesn't, you don't need to convince, uh, 3 billion people to understand this. You have to convince maybe 25 or 200. I don't know what the number is, but I think it's way less than, uh, than I need a billion people to figure this out. I, uh, I, I agree. Yes. I, I actually completely agree. So um, I know it doesn't sound like that, but I, I believe I believe there will see s still be some correlation of the having with what we've seen with this like whatever 15, 20 X followed by 70 to 80 percent drop. I do not believe and again, I'm totally guessing here. I don't believe the drop will be 80 percent this time around. I'll be I think it'll be drastically reduced and then it'll be reduced again next having cycle. And then again, the 2032 cycle because of di dispersed education. Plus just the stock to flow impact where like the having just doesn't make as much as an impact from the, again, from a stock to flow perspective, those two things coinciding, I think it will be like really boring ebbs and flows of price with the having I've cycles. Got, I've got with, a weird theory on that. So I think that what we're going to see, uh, from this point kind of moving further to the right in the timeline is I think you're going to start to see such aggressive impairment kind of manifest itself in in the, the legacy financial fiat system that it's going to be somewhat similar to like what we saw in COVID where we had this, this just unprecedented impairment that happened in March of 2020. I think that you're going to see those scenarios like quickly present themselves. You're going to see fiat get bid like crazy through that impairment because they're like all these paper promises are just blowing up and the cascading effect of that is going to be wild 
And I think that they're going to have to step in and plug these holes with so much fiat firepower that you're going to see a, a bounce back, a swing back. So like the, what we've seen in the first, let's call it the first half of Bitcoin was that we had these 80% drawdowns, but they were like long and drawn out and, and lasted a year. I think you still see like crazy volatility, but it's much maybe shorter. And, um, and like once they plug the hole that it just comes screaming back into it, similar to the, so if you go to Jim's, uh, Twitter, he has a picture of the 1920s, uh, Germany, uh, you know, the volatility that was happening in gold relative to the mark. And then you have this quote, you got lucky holding gold instead of the German mark post-World War I. No, I understood money and I'm able to zoom out was, was your quote on top of this, this chart, which I think a lot of people in Bitcoin are familiar with. But, and, and I'm not saying that that's what is going to happen. I just wouldn't be surprised if that was what was, hap what was playing out moving forward. That is, uh, I would agree, that's my thesis. And with, with the adopters, like, uh, I mean, we're seeing that already. Like, for instance, the whole, uh, the Fidelity mutual funds up in Canada, you know, there's yeah. like the, the, the total allocation funds. So like the, their conservative has a 1%, their moderate's a 2% and their aggressive is three, I believe. Yeah. I, I believe uh, that by the, by the end of next year, we will see those not just in Canada, but in the U S with fidelity funds. And it would not surprise me if we see one to 5% allocation in fidelity's target date funds. That means they're going to be an incredible amount of people who own Bitcoin inside of their 401k plans just by opting into the 2060 target date fund, because that's when I'm going to retire, you know? Yeah. And then suddenly, you know, institutions, Fidelity's not going to be trading this like some bro, like that leads to these massive ebbs and flows of the ha of these, the hype cycles. Um, they're, they're more long-term informed holders. So I co totally agree. I'm just really curious to see to what extent retail versus institutional is able to impact these things. Um, I, again, I, I would, I would argue it's going to be massively reduced, but still noticeable. And maybe I'm projecting that I just hope it's there because man, I hope it's there. You know, how, how yeah, amazing would be if Bitcoin goes up. Yeah. The save yeah. all these people. They're going to get wrecked. Well, yeah, I mean, by just, the way, uh, the, the, the rebalancing on these for them to keep it at 1% is just such a punch in the face. Like it's, such a punch in the face for performance, but uh, I'm sure that's what they're going to do. They're going to, they're going to rebalance it. They're going to keep it at like one or 3% or whatever the number is that, that the mandate inside the fund is. And it's just going to be the, relative to just owning it and just letting it run. Right. The it's phantom gonna, tax, oh the phantom God. taxes are going to be hilarious. It's like, what? Please. I didn't sell anything. It's like, oh, it's because we sold Bitcoin 19 times in August, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, any, con do you want to even talk about the ETFs versus owning, uh, owning it outright and at spot and taking custody and that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, I mean, with, I, I advocate to own Bitcoin directly. Like if you're going to own Bitcoin, you probably won't own Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, we start with that. Like it's the, the purest well, way of. So I, I think everybody's going to agree with you, but I think the, the, the counterpoint comes up and I'm not saying that this is my counterpoint, but somebody who would be sitting here arguing would be like. You know, my grandma cannot self custody. She would be a disaster. She'd lose the keys. She'd have no idea what, like, how how to technologically manage that risk. And so, for somebody like that, is is the sixty one hundred two attack more risky than grandma's incompetence? I think is really kind of the question. So good. So, um, is it riskier? The question here is: Is it riskier to have a sixty one hundred two or something like that, or to just not? have exposure to Bitcoin at all? That's the question. Are you, if are you, you're like, the, is grandma is the, not, question, is the question, do you not love grandma enough to help her with her self custody? Is grandma, <laughs> is grandma never going to buy it? You know, or like, so I, I have, I have a fair amount of clients who right now we have not gone and bought Bitcoin directly and moved it to cold storage. A, a, the majority have, but wow. there are lots who have not yet because it's like, Hey Jim, I agree. I need to have exposure to this thing. But like, We'll get there. It's like, cool. Let's just get exposure right now, like baby steps. Let's just, let's just get there and they'll continue learning. Like, it's inevitable. We go through, we have that conversation I walked you through earlier. And then afterwards, like, hey, let's, I want you to keep learning some more. And then I'll send them like, like, I love the, your first uh, episode with Breedlove on mm -hmm. uh, 
He crushed uh, misconceptions. So yeah. good. Yeah. I share that and a few more, like uh, the Parker Lewis of uh, Bitcoin's not a hedge, those sorts of things. I send it to them and maybe a copy of the Bitcoin standard, stuff like that. And then it's inevitable that within a few months, they reach out. And it's like, hey, Jim, can we talk about maybe buying more Bitcoin? And then it's like, hey, I want to own this thing directly. I want to, and we talk through like how to custody and all that fun stuff. But for grandma's sake, like maybe, maybe you have time to sit down with grandma and she trusts you to actually sit down. And it's like, all right, grandma, we're going to hop on river and we're going to buy Bitcoin and move it over to a, a cold card. She's like, at that point, you are buying it with her money. Let's just admit it. That's what you're doing. Um, it's maybe that's the case or grandma's not going to own any and you're not going to give her exposure at all because you're too consumed with she has to own in the most pure way versus like, look, just get your toes in. And I would rather go that way. And maybe, maybe that's wrong of me, but it's like, I'd rather have you get you exposure in some capacity than just like, well, too bad until you can really, and, until you've got laser eyes, Maxi, you're not going to own any of this. It's like, I mean, I first stepped into this through GBTC. Like, yeah, like, okay. But that forced me to keep learning more. And I yeah. think there's a lot of people out there. So I'm okay with that. It can be such a turnoff when uh, somebody's just willing to dip their toe in the water. And, uh, you know, some of us that have been around for a while just start screaming from the mountaintops. No, you're doing it all wrong. And I mean, I'm guilty as the next person. And um, yeah, I think I think it's really important for us collectively as a community to just, uh, I guess, be deeply empathetic to everybody that's showing up for the first time. Most people are just so dang busy just trying to fight the fiat uh, system, like their savings just being sucked away from them and just not having enough buying power and working three jobs to, like they just don't have time to deeply understand such a complex problem. And we just need to be empathetic to them and meet them where they're at. Yeah. It is funny. I feel like I do live in a meme world. Like the right now, like that that meme of like, wow, that's crazy. Hey, did you catch the game last night? Yeah. You know, like yeah. it is that is frustrating, but just recognizing like, yeah, that was me once. Like, wow, that's yeah. crazy. Hey, did you catch totally. the game? Like that was that was me. Or like the one of they're at the party and it's like they don't even know. I feel like that every time Bitcoin's pumping, I'm like walking the sidewalk and it's like in my head, it's like I'm the guy at the party. They don't even know that Bitcoin's pumping, or they don't even know that the dollar's cr you know, trash. Um, so, uh, Lynn uses that one a lot. She uses that one really well. <laughs> it's just, yeah, those, they, they crack me up, but in my head, I'm like, wow, I'm a, I'm a walking meme. Um, but we, we, I think those are, those are, uh, they can be, uh, very punctual ways of highlighting problems or solutions, but we need to be aware of how we're losing, using those, uh, those tools. Um, I love the one, I think, I think it's Lynn who shares this one pretty often. It's the, uh, the Morpheus of, so mm. what you're saying, so you're saying that one day I'll be able to sell my Bitcoin for millions. No, what I'm saying is, uh, what, uh, when you're able to, you won't have to or yeah. whatever. Like, yeah. I love that. And you could pull that out and they'd be like, what are you talking about? But it's, it's using it in good ways. You know, we've got a, we've got a Swiss army knife of, of memes and education, like understand how to use it. You're trying to go in there and help somebody to get a splinter out or whatever. You're not trying to go and stab them and shank them to death. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's what happens a lot. People walk away hurt and bitter because they were just shanked a bunch. And it's like, why didn't you listen? It's like, well, man, like use the tools you have to help, um, not to poke too much. There's a place of poke. There are people like the financial planners. I poke a lot because sometimes they just need to be poked. But most people, they just need to come in. And it's like, hey, come here. I need to, let me help you get this thing off you. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. I think I'm going to title this one, What is Causing Clown World and Bitcoin's Solution with Jim Kreider. Jim, this was, this was a blast. Really, really enjoyed this. Uh, just enjoy being a friend of yours. You are such a great person and somebody that I, I really admire in the space. And uh, I appreciate you making time to, to come on the show and have this chat. Yeah, thanks for... Give, give people a handoff uh, to your financial services. Uh, man, um, I'm on Twitter. It's at, uh, Jim Kreider TX is in Texas. Um, my financial planning company, we, I worked specifically like for the first two years, I didn't allow anyone over the age of 45. Um, so only young families last spring, I started allowing older people traditional, we'll call them. Um, and then right now I'm actually, uh, heavily pushing and I'll, I'll take younger clients, but I'm actually really pushing heavily into more traditional, like retirees and pre-retirement because of frustrations, seeing like, 
you know, if they're going pre- pretty much anywhere else, they're going to be thrown in a 60, 40 portfolio and totally ignored on this stuff. So because of that, mm-hmm. it's like my parents actually were the catalyst. They need a new financial planner. I couldn't find anyone to help them. I was like, fine, I'll work with them. And if I, if I'm, if I can't send my parents somewhere else, how can I in good conscience send other people somewhere else? So anyways, that, uh, if you want to throw a minute on my calendar, it's my, the website is, uh, it's a mouthful. It's intentional living FP as in financial planning. So intentional living FP.com. My calendar's there. Happy to chat. Even if it's just like, Hey, I have a quick question. Yeah. Like that's what I do here to help. Love it. We'll have a link in the show notes, uh, for people to just click on that and, uh, link up with you. And again, thank you so much, Jim. This was a blast. Yeah. Thanks, Preston. I think I heard Sailor say, you know, if it's good for a million, it's good for 10 million. If it's good for 10 million, it's good for a hundred million. And if you take that concept and you start, you know, applying $10 million per Bitcoin times a hundred, you start looking at those numbers, they're staggering. That is financial strength because they have the ability to use those assets as collateral to generate a yield. 